And wherever he seems to be overemphasizing things in one way, the teacher overemphasizes in the opposite way, so as to arrive at the middle way. So then, with this emphasis on life is suffering, uh, it's simply saying, this is the problem we're dealing with. We hurt. We human beings feel pretty unfairly treated <clears throat> because we are born into a world so arranged that the price that we pay for enjoying it, that is to say, for having sensitive bodies, is that these bodies are at the same time because they are sensitive, capable of the most excruciating agonies. Isn't that a nasty trick to play on us? What are we going to do about it? This is the problem. So then when the Buddha says, the cause of suffering is desire. Trishna uh, is our word thirst, and may perhaps be translated desire in a very general sense, or perhaps better, craving, clinging, grasping, something like that. He is saying, now, uh, I'm going to make this suggestion. You suffer because you desire. Now, supposing then you try not to desire, and see if by not desiring, you can cease from suffering. Or you can put the same thing in another way. You can say to a person, it's all in your mind. <clears throat> there is nothing either good or ill, but thinking makes it so. And therefore, if you can control your mind, you've nothing else that you need control. For example, uh, you don't need to control uh, the rain if you can control your mind. If you get wet, it's only your mind that makes you think it's uncomfortable to be wet. A person who's got good mental discipline can be perfectly happy wandering around in the rain. You don't need a fire if you've got good mind control. Uh, because if you've got uh, ordinary bad mind control, when it gets cold, you start shivering. That's because you're putting up a resistance to the cold. You're fighting it. But don't fight it. Relax to the cold. And uh, in other words, this is a matter of mental attitude and then you'll be fine. Always control your mind. This is another way of approaching it, do you see? Now then, <clears throat> as soon as the student begins to experiment with these things, he finds out that it's not so easy as it sounds. Not only is it very difficult not to desire, not only is it very difficult to control your mind, but there's something phony about the whole business. And this is what you're intended to discover. That namely, when you try to eliminate desire in order to escape from suffering, you desire to escape from suffering. You are desiring not to desire. In other words, I'm not merely playing with logic. I'm saying that a person who is escaping from reality will always feel the terror of it. It'll be like the hound of heaven that pursues him. And he's escaping in a way even when he's trying not to escape. And it was this point, you see, that this method of teaching was supposed to educate from you, to draw out from you, not by saying to anybody, <clears throat> all this in the first place, but by making the experiment not to desire or the experiment to control your mind thoroughly, this is the first step. You, to understand this, you must go through that or some equivalent of it. So as to come to the point where you see you are involved in a vicious circle. 
that in trying to control your mind, the motivation, the reason for which you were doing it, is still clinging and grasping. There is still self-protection. There is still lack of trust and love. So, when this is understood, the student returns to the teacher and says, look, this is my difficulty. I cannot eliminate desire because that itself, my effort to do so, is itself desire. I cannot eliminate selfishness because my reasons for wanting to be unselfish are selfish. As one of the Chinese uh, Buddhist classics puts it, when the wrong man uses the right means, the right means work in the wrong way. Now, the right means are all the traditional disciplines. And you're going to use them, you see? You're going to practice zazen or whatever and uh, make yourself into a Buddha. But, you see, if you're not a Buddha in the first place, you can't become one because you'll be the wrong man. And you're using the right means, but because you're using them for a selfish intent or a, a fearful intent, you're afraid of suffering and you don't like it and you want to get out of it, you want to escape, all these, you see, are the motivations which frustrate the right means. So one is meant to find that out. And so then, in course of time, when all this was thoroughly explored by the Buddha's disciples, there developed a very evolved form of this whole technique of dialectic, which was called Madhyamika. M-A-D-H-Y-A-M-I-K-A. It means the middle way. But it was uh, a, a form of Buddhist uh, practice and instruction developed by Nagarjuna, N-A-G-A-R-J-U-N-A, -A, who lived approximately in 200 A.D. Nagarjuna's method is simply an extension and uh, drawing to logical conclusions of the method of dialogue that already existed, except that Nagarjuna took it to, a, to an extreme. And his method is simply this. To undermine, to cast doubts on, any proposition to which his student will cling. To destroy all intellectual formulations and all concepts of the nature of reality or the nature of the self whatsoever. Now, you might think that that was simply a parlor game, a little intellectual exercise, but if you engaged in it, you would find it was absolutely terrifying. And you would feel yourself brought very close to the verge of madness. Because a skillful teacher in this method reduces you to a shuddering state of total insecurity. I have watched this being done among people you would consider perfectly uh, ordinary, normal Westerners who thought they were getting involved in just a nice abstract intellectual discussion. But then finally the teacher as the process goes on, discovers in the course of the discussion what are the fundamental premises to which every one of his students is clinging. What is the foundation of sanity? What do you base your life on? And when he has found out what that is for each student, he destroys it. He shows you that you can't found a way of life on that that it leads you into all sorts of inconsistencies and foolishness. And the student turns back to the teacher and says, well, it's all very well for you to, to pull out all the carpets from under my feet. What would you propose instead? And the teacher says, I don't propose anything. He's no fool. <laughs> he doesn't put up something to be knocked down. <laughs> uh, but you see, here are you. <clears throat> And you, if you don't put up something to be knocked down, then you can't play ball with the teacher. <laughs> and you may say, well, 
I don't need to. Then on the other hand, there's something nagging you inside, telling you you do. And so you go and play ball with him, and he keeps knocking it down. Whatever you propose, whatever you cling to. And this uh, exercise produces in the individual a real traumatic state. <laughs> People get acute anxiety. And you wouldn't think so, because it's just seemed as if it were nothing more than a discussion on a very intellectual and abstract level. But when it really gets down to it, and you find that you don't have a single concept you can really trust, it's the heebie-jeebies. But it is, uh, you are preserved from insanity by the discipline, by the atmosphere set up by the teacher, and by the fact that he seems perfectly happy without anything uh, in the way of a concept to cling on to. And the student looks at him and says, he seems to be all right. Maybe, maybe I can be all right too. You know, this gives a certain confidence, a certain feeling that all is not mad because the teacher, in his own way, is perfectly normal.